It's LGBT History Month here in the UK and of course I'm me, I wasn't going to go the whole month without talking about something queer history. So today I've got an episode that's been incredibly highly requested over the years. The who's who of potential queer monarchs from here in Britain. And make sure you stay tuned because I have a very exciting sex toy giveaway coming up for you very shortly. Here in Britain, we have one of the longest running monarchies in the world and arguably one of the most famous monarchies as well. Like, love it or hate it, there's no denying that they play a huge part in British history, English history before Britain even existed, world history thanks to colonisation. And yet, there has never been an out queer monarch. Historians do tend to argue about when exactly the monarchy started. We could go all the way back to Egbert in 827, but for the sake of this video, we're going to start with the Norman kings, from when monarchy was supposed to be passed through blood and not bloodshed. That's 40 something monarchs, and somehow not a single one of them was gay. Law averages tells us that some of them must have been, and reading between the lines of the history books, it seems like some of them almost definitely were, so let's explore. But first I want to take a moment to thank our sponsor today, Belessa, a bi woman company for all things sexual wellness. Their mission is to empower everyone to embrace, explore and celebrate their sexuality. And together we are hosting a very exciting giveaway. They are literally sending out free vibrators and gift cards to everyone who signs up using my link. I am a huge advocate for sexual freedom, we're all adults around here, and I believe in talking freely about sex and our experiences, in sharing pleasure, something I believe to be even more important as I head into my 30s. Life's just too short not to enjoy yourself, so today I want to talk to you about some of my favourite toys from them. First up we have the pebble, this little thing is redefining sex tech with orgasms made more simple than ever before. It's ergonomically built to fit perfectly in your hand, it has no annoying pattern modes, just five levels of vibration and suction controlled by dedicated buttons right on the back here. Next up is the thump, I have never seen anything like this before and it literally does everything, it vibrates, it suctions and it thumps, utilising Blesser's pleasure jet technology and the true feel vibrations naturally complement the suction at its targeted base. This is the de facto replacement for all external clit stimulating vibrators, this literally does it all. And finally we have the Air Vibe, this has dual G-spot and clitoral simulation, this is the best of both worlds. It comes in very discreet casing, they all do, it's completely silent but deadly, helping you reach new levels of pleasure. All three toys are waterproof and USB rechargeable and I promise any of them are going to show you a real good time, whether that's by yourself or with a partner. So if you're interested, make sure you enter that giveaway for a chance to win a free vibrator or a gift card to use on their website. Just because Valentine's Day has now ended, that doesn't mean you can't treat yourself, I'm sure you deserve it. I'm pretty sure there would have been a lot less drama in the monarchy if some of our past kings and queens had access to Blesser, much more chill probably. As someone who is fascinated by queer history, I very often come across the argument of you can't label people in history because they're not here to defend themselves, which mostly comes from straight people because as a queer person, my first thought is, what are they defending themselves against? Speculating about somebody's sexuality, especially historical figures, is a pretty neutral action. And it's something that we all do, all day, every day, every time we go out in public. Like, why is it only okay to assume somebody's sexuality if they're straight, not if they're queer? Now, I'm not talking about outing people here, that's a whole other kettle of fish and it's something that you shouldn't do, but it is okay to wonder if people are gay or straight. Most people I find who get their backs up about such a thing are the people who have their own ingrained biases and their own ingrained homophobias, who assume it's a bad thing inherently to be queer, and therefore to think that other people might be queer as well. This whole topic is something I could discuss with people for hours and it becomes even more interesting when you add history into the mix. Because throughout history, language has evolved, cultures have evolved, acceptance has evolved. There are pockets of time where it was considered fashionable to be queer, or where people would simply turn their heads. There are other times when it was just downright illegal. And of course, we are focusing on Britain here in this episode, so this is very like white person, Britain centric. That is why I am very aware of people struggle with homosexuality in other countries all around the world. We're talking about British monarchs, so I'm talking about British history. 
But there were periods in history where it was very normal for men to sleep with other men and then just go home to their wives and their families. It was just the way it was. And we're also trying to apply modern day terms to history here, which isn't always possible. It's very difficult to apply modern sexual identities to the past. Our understanding today of homosexuality, gay, straight, bisexual, transgender, lesbian, comes along with our modern day society and history doesn't work like that. So whilst we can say this king slept with men, it doesn't mean they would have necessarily identified as gay by today's standards. Maybe, but maybe not. The concept of sexuality and sexual identities didn't really exist throughout much of history. For a lot of history, there was only the sexual act, not the sexual identity, especially in medieval England. Sex wasn't really seen as an act between two people, it was an act that one person did to another person. There was the active person and the passive person. As you can probably guess, the active person was the male, the passive person was the female. So even by a woman taking on the active role in sexual acts, like by being on top, that was considered to be sodomy, that was considered to be unnatural sex. In a lot of historical texts, you'll see the word sodomy, and by today's understanding, you take that to mean like sex between men, but that is not the case. A lot of the time it was just unnatural sex as a whole, where the woman wasn't passive and the man wasn't active. On top of that, add in the fact that historians have historically just not paid attention to obvious signs of queerness. Historical figures who would quite clearly be queer to queer people just go over the heads of straight people who simply don't see queerness as what it is when it's there. I mean, there's that whole meme of, and they were roommates or close platonic friends when referring to very clearly queer people, historians refusing to call them what they are because it makes them or might make their audience uncomfortable. Queer people have always been here, but history forgets about them. Don't you think it's really weird that out of all the people you learned about in history, none of them were ever gay? When it comes specifically to the monarchy, there are a fair few who we can probably assume were gay by today's standards. Maybe more that we don't assume were. But we have got to remember that the number one role of the monarch was always to create an heir, no matter what your personal sexual proclivities are. No matter if men preferred men or women preferred women, they had to have an heir. And there was only one way to do that. Meaning they would often be forced, or not even forced, just they would just go into straight appearing relationships regardless of what they preferred. Also just marriage within the monarchy has never been about love, about who you'd want to be with, about who you find sexually appealing. Marriage within the monarchy has always been about politics. You marry whoever is going to benefit your politics to strengthen relationships between countries and families, to have children to further that strength. All of which is quite a unique king or queen position to be in. Which brings us on to our first potentially queer monarch, King William II, the son of William the Conqueror. William, who was known as William Rufus for the most part thanks to his very red hair, ruled from 1087 to 1100, and he took over a very hostile country who weren't very happy with the new Norman rule, and therefore he just wasn't very liked. Also, he just didn't do things that made people like him. He raised taxes, he imposed the death penalty on people who hunted deer in any forest that he deemed as his, which is very ironic because he eventually died in the new forest whilst out hunting. He was shot through the heart with an arrow. His death and the rumours around his sexuality are probably what he's most well known for today. You see, William never married, which was very strange for this time. He did appear at one point to consider marriage to Edith of Scots, but that never ended up happening. And even the most single of kings did usually end up having illegitimate children, but William never did. Men weren't quite held to the same standards of purity that women were, they could kind of sleep around, and in a time before birth control as we know it, royalty would end up with illegitimate kids all over the place. But William just didn't even have that. Now he may have simply been sterile, but this whole situation has led to many a historian speculating that he just had no interest in women and may have been much more interested in men. At the time, he was noted to have dressed very flamboyantly. Contemporaries at the time actually did raise concerns about a court dominated by effeminacy, but this seemed much more to do with William's choice of attire rather than any genuine suspicion of sexual acts. And whilst homosexuality or sodomy would have been a sin in this time, it would have been a relatively minor one. 
Historian Frank Barlow wrote in 2008 of the words of monk William of Malmesbury at the time. Hair was worn long, clothes were luxurious, and shoes had pointed and curled toes. Young men rivalled women in the softness of their bodies, walked with mincing steps, and as they moved, revealed their thighs. A band of effeminates and a flock of harlots followed the court, so that the court of the King of England was more a brothel of calamities than the House of Majesty. Malmesbury hadn't seen William's court firsthand, but he'd heard the stories and the rumours, and he was shocked. All the noblemen that William seemed to keep around him were wildly effeminate. And we all know that femininity in men doesn't automatically equal gay, but this is a train of thought that has been around for a very long time. There was also Anselm, the Archbishop of Canterbury at this time, with whom it's actually rumoured that William II had a very difficult relationship. He held audiences with the king on a sort of semi-regular basis, and on one occasion they actually discussed the king's private life, and they also raised issues of sodomy in the land. Now, sodomy was just something that always seemed to be brought up around William II, privately kind of during his reign for the most part, but the rumours would grow much stronger in the immediate decades after his death. Anselm was said to be so upset by William's choices as a monarch, they actually eventually fled into exile. Monk and historian Orderic Vitalis would write a critique of William in the years after, claiming that his reign was given to sodomitical love, again referencing the audacious fashions, absurdly long fashionable pointy shoes of the time, and their very tight-fitting shirts. In William's narrative, there just seems to be a lot of very religious churchmen worried about masculinity going down the drain. Men aren't real men anymore, they're spending way too long on their hair, they said. This was the 1090s, and this is still a narrative that we're hearing in 2024, proving this kind of moral panic around men being effeminate has been around for centuries. God forbid men show any kind of femininity, the downfall of society is just around the corner. If that's the case, it's coming very slowly, isn't it? Like we've been waiting over a thousand years at this point. It was only really after William's death that historians and writers started openly referring to him as a sodomite, a homosexual. I suppose to do so during his reign would have been a very swift way to a beheading. Historian Frank Barlow has pointed out the chroniclers at the time seem to have no doubts about William's homosexual leanings, but he may of course also have been bisexual. His court was said to have a number of female sex workers, concubines, and there were no male favourites ever really noted of his. And a favourite in this context, you're gonna be hearing the word a lot, means the intimate companion of a ruler. Kings often had their wife and then their mistresses and their favourites, a very open secret. This is their number one favourite person. For some monarchs, they had a sexual relationship with their favourites, for some, they didn't. None of William's favourites were ever noted, male or female, although his most frequent advisor and friend was Ranulf Flambard, who he appointed as Bishop of Durham in 1099. He's usually implicated as being William's most obvious sexual partner, but again, that is just a guess, Ranulf was just around him a lot. A lot of churchmen just dismissed William Rufus for his general lustfulness, so he may have just been wildly unfussy, sleeping with whoever he fancied. But also, William just famously did not get on with the church in general, so there very much could have been an element here of them just wanting to besmirch his name. As with so many of these monarchs, we never know what the truth is. This is all just rumour and speculation, looking into history and seeing what we can pull out. The next maybe queer king is widely thought to have been Richard I, Richard the Lionheart, gay icon who ruled from 1189 to 1199. He's a very interesting king, so he never really spent much time in England, he didn't really speak the language, he wasn't all that interested in it. And during his very long absences, he would leave his younger brother John in charge. And yes, you may recognise these names from the tale of Robin Hood. Richard came to the throne after his father decided to divide England's territory among his four children upon his death. And of course, sibling rivalry, None of the children were very happy with this, they all wanted to be the only ruler, and this resulted in a brutal civil war. But with the support of his mother and a very strong ally in the form of Philip II, the King of France, Richard would eventually win. And it was this very strong relationship with Philip that would be the source of gay rumours for many centuries to come. These two men would become very, very close, resulting in all sorts of rumours around what was going on with them. 
Contemporary chronicler Roger of Haldern would write in 1187 that Richard remained with Philip, the King of France, who so honoured him for so long that they ate every day at the same table and from the same dish, and at night their beds did not separate them. On account of this vehement love that seemed to have arisen between them, the King of England, who was still Henry II at this point, he hadn't quite died, was greatly stupefied and wondered what it could mean, and taking precautions for the future, frequently sent messengers into France for the purpose of recalling his son, Richard. So Henry II clearly had his own suspicions about what was going on there. Reading this through a modern eye seems very clear. They shared a bed, they shared meals, clear signs of a romantic relationship. But this was medieval England, and those things alone meant very little. In fact, sharing a bed was often seen as a sign of trust between politicians, a sign of the alliance between England and France. And the same could be said for sharing plates of food, it was just trust and understanding. But the vehement love was unusual wordings, and those exact words weren't used because this was Old English at this time, so it actually read vehementum amor, which comes from the Latin word vementia, which is emotion of the souls that was beyond bounds. So this was a very sort of strong statement, vehement love, they were bound together. Halden also states in his text that Philip loved him as his own soul, and they loved each other so much that the King of England was absolutely astonished by the passionate love between them, and just marvelled at it. Just really drilling that message home, they really, really loved each other. As Richard won the fight to become king, partially thanks to Philip and his allyship, he headed to Messina in Sicily. This was around late 1190 or early 1191. Roger of Halder would write about how he seemed to seek penance there, saying, Richard, king of England, the divine grace inspiring him there too, being sensible of the filthiness of his life after due contrition of the heart, having called together the archbishops and bishops who were with him at Messina, fell naked at their feet, and did not hesitate to confess to God in their presence the filthiness of his life. For the thorns of lustfulness had departed from his head, and it was not the hand of man that rooted them out, but God, the father of mercies, who wished not for the death of sinners, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live. Basically, Richard travelled to Messina and made a public atonement for his sexual sins, for the filthiness of his life. And it probably wasn't for sins committed with women, for extramarital sex. Every king, as far back as we can count, would have had mistresses, and no one else has ever been forced to make public penance, apart from maybe our current king, but that's a whole other thing. But whatever Richard did, did require this public penance. Surely after this, he would go on to get married. He would marry Berengaria, the oldest daughter of King Sacho IV of Navarre. And this was all big drama, because at this point, Richard was actually betrothed to Alice, the sister of Philip. Richard claimed that Alice had actually had an affair with his father and had given birth to his illegitimate child, so they couldn't get married. Now, Richard and Berengaria would never have children, and he doesn't have any recorded mistresses, although it is thought that he maybe had a single illegitimate child, Philip of Cognac, with an unknown mother. So we know he did sleep with women at some point, but there wasn't really much scandal going on. So why all the penance? Also, historically, any scandal with kings and mistresses has always been deflected onto the women involved rather than onto the men. Mistresses would take the brunt of it over the king any day, which is the patriarchy in action. But there was no deflection here, there was no woman to push onto, but still, Richard was making penance. Why? Whilst Richard and Philip did have a very strong, very close relationship in those early days, their relationship would eventually turn sour. Very strong lovers to enemies here. By the end of his rule, Philip and France would actually be his greatest enemies, and they even went off to war against each other. So it's safe to say their relationship didn't quite work out. Is all of this enough to say that Richard I was definitely gay or definitely bisexual? As you'll hear a lot throughout this episode, there is no way of knowing, but the penances do make me suspect that perhaps he was. Historians will always try and dismiss and downplay very obvious or almost obvious signs of queerness throughout history. They will find whatever excuses they can for somebody not to be gay. But sometimes people are just gay. Maybe Richard was one of them. Our third monarch today is possibly the most well-known of the probably queer kings, and that is Edward II. He was definitely at least bisexual, he just didn't really seem to mind which gender he was with, but he did seem to show his male companions much, much more attention than his females. 
Edward took the throne in 1307 and he ruled for 20 years and he was not a particularly successful or well-liked monarch. The rule ended with him basically being overthrown by his own wife. Edward II's reign has long been fraught with rumours of homosexuality and his homosexuality has long been blamed for his failure as a monarch, which I don't necessarily think is the case, although it could be linked. His problem is that he had his favourites and he wasn't going to confront them for anything. Edward let his favourites essentially take over his role as leader, whether or not you believe he was sleeping with them, he would let his favourites do whatever the hell they wanted. Is it just easy to blame the fact that he was gay or maybe bisexual on his failures? We know that society loves to villainise the gays as a fantastic scapegoat. First favourite was a man called Piers Gaveston, who had been a big part of Edward II's life since 1300. He was a nobleman who made a very good impression on Edward I, Edward's father, so he assigned him to the household of his son, but it soon became clear that the relationship between the two was quite intense. Piers was clearly Edward's favourite, even years before he became king, whether you believe that to be as best friends, sworn brothers, or as lovers. Gaveston was so arrogant and annoying about the fact that he was favourite that he rubbed a lot of people up the wrong way, other royals and barons, and so Edward I was forced to send him into exile, just to remove the problem entirely. Rumour has it that the king decided to exile Gaveston after his son asked him to give Gaveston the entire country of Pontho, Pontheu, I don't know how to pronounce it, and the king was furious, like his son is asking him to give his friend an entire country. However, Gaveston was only temporarily exiled at this point and he was being given a very comfortable stipend. So people do tend to think the king did this purely to punish his son, to teach him a lesson because you can't have favourites like that. A lesson that Edward II didn't really pick up on. As you can probably imagine, Edward II, the son, was not happy about this. And so one of his very first acts when he became king very shortly after in 1307 was to just bring Gaveston back. And so their relationship just picked up where it left off. At this point in medieval England, homosexuality or sodomy was being fiercely condemned after a couple of centuries beforehand of much more liberal attitudes. The Catholic Church had decided it was no longer going to stand for sodomy, so any whispers of gayness would have been pretty scandalous. Which could be why in 1308, Edward married his wife, Isabella of France. Now Gaveston was also married and they did each have multiple children. So there is no doubt about either of their abilities to consummate with a woman, they definitely did. Edward also had an illegitimate son and there's evidence he had an affair with his niece as well. Quite literally a bisexual king. Also having an affair with his niece, gross. In the 1320s though, an anonymous chronicler described Edward's deep love for Gaveston, writing, he entered into a covenant of constancy and bound himself with him before all other mortals with a bond of indissoluble love, firmly drawn up and fastened with a knot. That sounds like marriage. In 1334, the Bishop of Winchester apparently stated that Edward II had been a sodomite. In the 1390s, the Mew Chronicles noted that he gave himself too much to the vice of sodomy. So Piers Gaveston was always Edward's favourite, in whatever context you want to believe, although people at the time seemed to believe it was sodomy. In 1308, when Edward II left England to go to France and marry Isabella, he named Gaveston as regent in his absence. And once again, Gaveston rubbed a lot of noblemen up the wrong way. He enjoyed his power just a little bit too much. He didn't do anything like awful in this time, but he was just arrogant. People didn't like him. When the king returned, it said that he ignored his wife and just paid undivided attention to Gaveston which maybe is for the best because rumour has it that she was just 12 years old at this time. A lot of noblemen ended up coming together and putting in what would be the medieval version of a formal complaint about the blatant favouritism that was going on. And then in April, in a declaration, they officially demanded the exile of Gaveston. Now, Edward refused this at first. He was a king, he could refuse it. But then it became very clear that the noblemen had the support of King Philip IV of France, who was furious at Edward's treatment of his daughter, Isabella. She was being ignored in favour of this random man. So in May, Gaveston was sent into exile for a second time, but Edward was working on getting him back even before he was gone, and by the next year, he'd succeed. He was back again. Upon his return, Gaveston was given the earldom of Cornwall, and he just immediately aggravated everyone once more. 
A big part of the problem wasn't the rumoured gayness, but more the fact that Gaveston just wasn't a very nice person. He was constantly exploiting the king for his own gain. Anything he asked for, he got. So the same all happened once again. Gaveston ended up being exiled for a third time. And less than two months later, he returned and Edward just restored all lands back to him very on again, off again, very frustrating for the people around them. So much so that the royal and baronial parties started to prepare for war. Gaveston set up fort at Scarborough, he was pronounced excommunicated and the barons started to divide up the realm in opposition to the king, with the main goal being to capture Gaveston, who was holed up at this point with the king. They were literally in hiding together, truly like riding or dying. They were going to war for their love. They very nearly got caught and in the May, Gaveston ended up surrendering and despite an oath being made to keep him safe and alive, in June he was ran through with a sword and beheaded by two Welshmen. Edward was reportedly devastated. But not too devastated because pretty soon he moved on, choosing another favourite in the form of Hugh Le Dispenser, the son of the Earl of Winchester. Once again, Edward would bestow his favourite with all these honours, Hugh would abuse his position, and he ended up taking control of a huge amount of South Wales. Once again, the king would be willing to do anything that Hugh asked of him. And land in this time equaled power, so Hugh had a lot of power. Anyone who crossed him would be whispered into the ear of the king, and their lives would be destroyed. Which, once again, the barons, the noblemen, weren't really happy with. They didn't like one person having all this power, and such control over the king. Edward attempted to reconcile, but the opposition ended up occupying London until Hugh and the rest of the dispensers were permanently removed, to which Edward was forced to agree in the moment, but then he would go on to plot his revenge, and he used his poor wife Isabella as a chess piece. He sent Isabella to the home of one of the main rebels, the Baron of Badlesmere at Leeds Castle, where she requested to be accommodated for the night. Now usually, hosting a queen would have been a huge honour, but considering everything that was going on and the fact that Lord Badlesmere wasn't home, Lady Badlesmere refused the request. Now they knew this was going to happen, but the queen feigned outrage and ordered her guards to force their way in, and the garrison returned fire to protect the castle, and several of the queen's guards were killed in the process just like they planned. Because this is what Edward wanted, a reason to start a war against the rebels, and now he had a moral high ground. Isabella was just a queen who wanted a bed for a night, and Badlesmere had killed several men in response. It made people feel bad for them and angry at the rebels. One by one, Edward was able to win over each baron again and take back control, and then he brought Hugh back. Isabella, as you can probably imagine, wasn't really a fan of Hugh. The king showed him all his attention and not her, and now Hugh was back and was even more drunk on power. In 1324, Isabella's brother, Charles IV of France, made a threat against Edward, and so, in response, Edward commanded that all the French in England and Wales be arrested. Now, Isabella herself was obviously French, so Hugh took the king at his word and placed Isabella under house arrest, taking her away from her children. And Edward watched this and did nothing. This was a turning point for Isabella. She was furious. She now, like, hated him. Then a lot of stuff happens, which is kind of irrelevant to the queerness of this episode, but Isabella basically ends up running back to France and organising an invasion of England. She promised noblemen that if they joined her side, they would replace Edward with their son, Edward III, to which she was overwhelmed with support. She sailed to East Anglia and made her way to London. She was just about to dethrone Edward when he heard the news and him and Hugh galloped away into the sunset, heading to Hugh's base in South Wales, where they learned that Hugh's father had been fed to a pack of dogs. Undoubtedly, that was also what they had planned for the king and Hugh if they caught them as well. This big chase followed and eventually the king and Hugh were captured and swiftly murdered. The story has always been that Edward was murdered by having a red-hot poker inserted into his anus, which is a very badly veiled reference to his sin of sodomy. It's not a true story, but has always been the accepted version of his death. People are very willing to believe that a man is punished for the crime of homosexuality. In actuality, we don't know exactly how he died. We know he was imprisoned for a bit, and then he may have died thanks to natural causes, or he may have been murdered. We don't really know. But what do you reckon when it comes to Edward II? Was this a man who had multiple very close friendships with men, sworn brothers? Or was this a man who was literally willing to ride and die for his love? 
Either way you look at it, people felt very threatened by a close relationship between the king and another man, whether that's Gaveston or Dispenser. Both times these men were run out of state and were eventually executed. Both times the king felt strongly enough to then overthrow his opposition. It is no wonder that this is a story which has been talked about again and again throughout history. I mean, Christopher Marlowe even wrote his play The Troublesome Reign and Lamentable Death of Edward II, depicting his version of this tale centuries later. People write their own versions to this day, all in varying amounts of gayness. It's no wonder that he is often regarded as the very first gay king, even though Edward wouldn't necessarily have had the language or understanding of sexual identity. Monarch number four today is James I of England and James IV of Scotland, the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. You'll very often find articles online referring to him as Britain's first openly gay monarch, although once again you've got to remember that that is not by today's standards. James ruled from 1603 to 1625, and throughout his youth, he was always praised for his chastity. He never showed any interest in women, he always preferred the company of men. Reminds me of myself as a teenager. I just wasn't interested in boys, I just didn't really care, I just liked hanging out with my girls. Gay. However, James got to a certain age and it became very clear that a marriage was required to reinforce his rule and his politics, so he was matched with 14-year-old Anne of Denmark. In the first few years of marriage, he was said to be a very attentive husband, and they would go on to have seven children, three of whom would survive to adulthood. But it would become clear to many throughout his reign that he had an eye for the men, maybe as well as women, or maybe exclusively. It just kind of became this open secret within the courts. James liked men. His first possible gay love affair dates back to when James was only a young teenager, 13 years old, although by this point he was already King of Scotland. He had a cousin called Esme Stewart who was 24 years older than him. Yes, he was 37 years old. Gross. As I said, James had always been praised for being a very chaste young man, but that may have been because he was in love with Esme. Esme travelled over to Scotland and he met James for the first time at his formal session and the two very quickly hit it off. Esme was established as the favourite at court. And the affection between these two was not kept secret. Esme was constantly being showered with gifts, honours, affection. James made him the Earl of Lennox and then the Duke of Lennox. He was the only Duke in Scotland, which was not a popular decision amongst other aristocracy. They would even embrace and kiss in public, although back then affection between men looked very different as it does nowadays, but like still, that was noted. Esme even converted from Catholic to Protestant for the king. They were literally joined at the hip. Everyone knew of Esme as much as they knew of James. In August 1582, the Lords, mad at Esme's rise to power, made a plan to separate the pair and hopefully weaken their joint power. And to everyone's surprise, it actually works. Basically, James goes out hunting one day, he's offered a place at Ruthven Castle to rest for the night, and once there, he's imprisoned, which is where he remains for a whole year. Any attempt Esme made to rescue him was foiled, but they did manage to sort of like set up a line of communication, they were exchanging constant letters. The stories of the imprisonment are actually a little bit wild. Apparently James just spent the entire year there being berated by his captors who were trying to convince him to cut ties with Esme and remove his positions. Apparently one bishop was so harsh that James just burst into tears. By the September, just one month in, James was forced to denounce Esme and banished him back to France, but they still kept James imprisoned, just in case. Even with Esme back in France, the pair would continue talking, and despite everyone being sure that he would convert back to Catholicism, he didn't. But then Esme fell ill and he died incredibly quickly. He commanded on his deathbed that his heart be delivered to King James. Esme had signed off multiple letters between the pair that his heart belonged to James and he followed through on his word, despite also being married to a woman. James, as you can probably imagine, was devastated when he heard the news about Esme's death. He wrote multiple poems about the loss with overt sexual imagery, poems that you can still find today. It was only after this that James would go on to marry Anne at 23 years old. Again, this was a political union, this was a marriage of politics, and she was never told the tales of Esme. And despite the fact that they would go on to have multiple children, it would actually take them five years before the first was born, thanks to mounting pressure for an heir. That's the only reason they started having kids, or so it's thought. 
Whilst Anne stuck with James until her death and followed him to England when he became king there, the two lived very separate lives. They didn't even live in the same palace. Anne's chaplain would comment that James was chaste, that they never had sex. And she commented this in 1607, the same year that James met Robert Carr, the Earl of Somerset. Robert Carr was a gentleman who had accompanied the Scottish court down to England when James took the throne there, but they weren't particularly close at that point. But then in 1607, Robert was thrown from a horse in the King's tournament and he broke his leg, to which James sent his personal physicians. That wasn't that unusual, like he got hurt at the King's tournament, so it was expected, but then James went to visit himself. Then again, then again, and then they were hanging out all the time. The King decided he was gonna teach Robert Latin. Just like with Esme before him, the pair became inseparable, Robert became the favourite, and he was given every title he possibly could be. Gentleman of the Bedchamber, Viscount Rochester, Knight of the Garter, Privy Councillor, Lord Treasurer of Scotland, Earl of Somerset, Lord Chamberlain, Keeper of the Privy Seal, and Secretary of State for England, that's just to name a few. Robert was said to be the man who James loved above all men living, including his wife and children it seems, as sort of his wife and James's relationship become very strange around this time. Carr became the most powerful man in England, next to the king of course, but he didn't really have the ability to do any of the tasks required of him, he was just a normal man bestowed with all these titles. So Carr hires an assistant to help and the assistant happens to be one of his lovers. Because whilst he was the king's main love, Carr had multiple, he had at least two other relationships with men that we know of. The assistant was a man called Thomas Overbury and the king very quickly clocked on to what was happening and he became overcome with jealousy. In 1613, James suggested that maybe Overbury might be better in a position in a foreign court, maybe in Russia, but he refused and found himself trapped in the tower because of it. Overbury starts writing letters to Carr to try and negotiate his release and he gets increasingly desperate. At one point he threatens that if he's not released soon, he's going to tell the king everything that Carr revealed to him in bed over the previous eight years. He literally uses those words. So there's not really much doubt that Carr and Overbury definitely had a physical relationship. Whether or not the Carr and the king did, that's argued, but they probably did. Eventually, Overbury dies in the tower and an investigation finds out that he was poisoned by none other than Carr's wife, Frances Carr. Is there a TV show of all this? Because if there isn't, can somebody please make it? This is gay drama at its best. It's not entirely known if Carr was aware of the murder plot, he probably wasn't, but he was quickly implicated, and all of Overbury's letters were brought out at trial as evidence, evidence of his abuse of the King's trust. Even James thought Carr was guilty and urged him to confess, knowing that if he did so, he could pardon him and everything could be put at rest. James was very likely concerned about being implicated himself if this went to court, everything coming out of trial. But Carr refused to confess and he was found guilty of murder. But the charges were eventually reduced and he was ruled an accessory after the fact instead of being a murderer. He was sentenced to imprisonment in the tower before James eventually allowed him out just to retire to his estate and everything was forgotten. After all this went down though, the relationship between the two was never quite the same. It said they met one last time and they passionately kissed. But how do you come back from this? Like James felt betrayed and besides, he'd already moved on. You see, in 1614, he'd met 21-year-old George Villiers. Villiers was just minor gentry, but men who opposed Carr's position at court thought that he'd be a very good replacement. If only they knew just how much of a good replacement. Carr hated Villiers and he kind of knew what was happening, but the noblemen gathered in support, they got Villiers a whole new wardrobe and they placed him at court starting in 1615, which is just when all the drama with Carr kicked off. James very quickly became obsessed with Villiers and so was everyone else in court and he also quickly rose through the ranks. But unlike Carr, he seemed to actually know what he was doing. James was apparently smitten, they would often show affection in court, which was said to be very excessive and uncomfortable for those who are witnessing it. 
Letters between the two showed them calling each other sweet child, sweet boy, and many times Villiers referred to himself as James's dog, something which has overtly sexual connotations. He would sign off most of his letters with, your majesty's most humble slave and dog. Other times they literally call each other husbands. One courtier would say, I never yet saw any fond husband make so much or so great dalliance over his beautiful spouse as I have seen King James over his favourite especially the Duke of Buckingham, George Villiers. I think out of all the monarchs I've spoken about today, James is possibly the most overtly gay. Villiers and James shared bedchambers and there's evidence to suggest that Villiers was even sat by James's side when he died, holding his hand. Affection and love was expressed differently all those years ago. Language was much more flowery. Men were much more tactile with each other. But even by those standards, James was a little bit gay. Many historians will still try to argue otherwise, but honestly, I don't have much faith in your standard historian correctly assessing queerness. Sorry. I figured we'd end this one with our first female queer monarch, Queen Anne. Anyone who's seen the film The Favourite will have an idea of where I'm going with this one, and if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you do. It is one of my favourite films. I love it. If you excuse the pun. Queen Anne ruled from 1702 to 1714, and before the favourite, much attention wasn't really paid to her and her rule. She was thought to be one of the more bland monarchs, who was always portrayed as a very badly educated woman with a pretty terrible personality. Her rule didn't have anything huge happen, there were no big dramas, and technically, she shouldn't ever have been made queen. She took the throne on somewhat of a technicality after a succession law came in, banning Catholics from taking the throne. By the time she took the throne in 1702, she had already been married for 19 years to Prince George of Denmark and Norway, during which she got pregnant 17 times in total, resulting in 12 miscarriages or stillbirths and four children who died incredibly young. One, Prince William, survived to the age of 11, but he died two years before Anne took the throne. Her relationship with her husband was thought to be very cordial, but it was a relationship purely for offspring for the most part, and the stress surrounding that did cause them to drift. Some believe that instead, the true love of Anne's life was her childhood best friend, Sarah Churchill, the Duchess of Marlborough. And yes, she is a distant ancestor of Winston Churchill. The pair were said to be inseparable, they were devoted to each other, and this caused quite a bit of gossip in the courts, even at the time. The pair met when Anne was 8 years old and Sarah was 13. Sarah had come to the court as the maid of honour to Mary of Medina, and they instantly hit off. They would write letters between each other constantly. Ten years later, Anne got married and appointed Sarah as her lady of the bedchamber, meaning they were pretty much always together. But there was undeniably a kind of power imbalance between the pair, and they knew it. In 1691, Anne suggested in a letter that instead of titles, the pair simply referred to each other as Mrs. Morley and Mrs. Freeman, in an attempt to kind of equalise their relationship, something which for a member of royalty was almost unheard of. To dispose of titles was a great act of closeness, a great act of affection. The next year, in another letter, Anne wrote to Sarah, I had rather live in a cottage with you than reign empress of the world without you. Another letter read, I long to be with you again, and tis impossible for you ever to believe how much I love you except you saw my heart. You might know that these are Anne's words to Sarah, and historians do suspect that whilst the pair did love each other, Anne's feelings were much deeper than her friends. Sarah Churchill, you see, was not a stupid woman, and she knew the power that a close relationship with Anne would bring her. She wanted more power in government issues, but Anne always sort of refused to let her get involved. Sarah was a very big supporter of the Whigs, and she wanted to place more Whig MPs in Parliament, whilst Anne very much didn't want to upset the so-called church party, the Tories. And there's nothing that's going to quite screw off a relationship like business. And despite the previous affection between them, their relationship would soon start to fizzle out. Sarah was not happy that Anne wasn't giving her power. But it was all good because Anne had already found somebody to replace her with, Sarah's cousin, Abigail Masham. Abigail's family had recently fallen from grace, so Sarah had taken her in, making her lady of the bedchamber to Queen Anne. Something that would backfire spectacularly when the pair fell out and Abigail took on the role of the favourite. 
It's said that the relationship between the pair infuriated Sarah, who may well have gone out and spread rumours about the Queen's sexuality in return, talking of her affair with Abigail and dark deeds of the night. Whether or not this was revenge born out of jealousy over the affair or anger that she was no longer able to get her way, we don't know. We do know that she accused Anne of having encounters with multiple of her ladies. She said that this was something she always did. A fierce rivalry developed between Sarah and Abigail as they vied for the Queen's attention. In 1708, Prince George passed away and Anne was reportedly devastated, but Sarah demanded that she leave his bedside, which hurt her deeply, and there was just no coming back from that. In 1711, Anne would dismiss Sarah from her court entirely. Sarah was cut off. She would go on to write memoirs about Queen Anne, painting her as this malevolent ruler, always scheming and lying to get her way. Which could explain why for so many centuries we had this idea of Anne as being just a bit useless, when in reality she did actually bring the Whigs and Tories together and formed the basis for our parliament today, so she was actually quite important as a monarch, but nobody really will, will say that. When talking about Queen Anne and her rumoured sexuality, you've got to bear in mind that female sexuality was never really considered, like even up to like the last century. Even when looking specifically into queer history, you'll find countless documents about homosexuality, about gay men, but very little about lesbianism. Most people just didn't consider women as sexual beings in their own right. And even if rumours did fly about Anne, they likely would have been brushed off by a lot of people refusing to believe that women find sex compelling. Lesbianism just went over the heads of a lot of people. It still does. I will literally be out with my fiance holding hands and people will be like, oh, your sisters. Oh, aren't you such good friends? Oh, isn't that lovely? No. So perhaps there was more evidence of Queen Anne's sexuality that would have just been brushed off at the time. Perhaps there wasn't. Perhaps it was all just rumours from Sarah Churchill. But what we can say is Anne got pregnant multiple times. She seemed to enjoy her husband's company. She was very religious. It's impossible to rule out the possibility of her having lesbian affairs with women, but there's also no empirical evidence of it, as her narrative was forever changed by Sarah Churchill and the memoirs. Out of all of the possibly queer monarchs I've spoken about in today's episode, Queen Anne is probably the one that I'm least convinced by, just because there's such a lack of evidence. But also, I wanted to include a woman in this video, so here we go. There are much less queens in history than there are kings, but I needed I needed to talk about a woman. Thank you so much for watching this. If you made it all the way to the end, then well done. I've been filming this for so long that it's literally almost dark outside now. <laughs> but I really, really enjoyed researching and filming and talking about this. You know that queer history is just like my bread and butter. It's the thing I find most interesting in this world. So if you stuck around, if you find it as interesting as I do, thank you so much. A huge thank you to Blessa for sponsoring us today. Make sure you check out the link to the giveaway in the description box. Honestly, you won't regret it. Live your best life. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys.